So obviously growing up, you know, you kind of spoke about being in an academy and everything else. Did you ever experience racism, whether it be there, at school or kind of on the streets? Um, well, when we lived in Leeds, we lived in quite a rough area. Yeah. Um, you know, I would be humble from where I grew up from. Um, but I think my first ever encounter was at school. Um, you know, being being a good footballer as a, as a young age, you know, people do get jealous and I first experienced it in the playground. And I didn't know how to take it at first because it was yeah. the first time. Um, you know, I got obviously a little bit angry, but obviously I didn't know how to, to take it. It was only the next time, maybe the two or third time after it, when it happened again, it sort of affected us more Yeah. Um, growing up. Um, but obviously my mum was by my side and explained it to us, but you know, she only could explain it the best she possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, then I'd ask my dad for advice and he obviously said growing up, he had to experience a lot of it. Yeah. And it's just about just being a bigger, bigger person and being a bigger man. My mum always explained it's obviously the it's the colour of your skin, that's what they're getting at. Um, so it made us angry that they were just coming after my skin colour, not just coming after me as a person. Yeah. Um, but the upbringing that I had, you know, my mum never told me to, you know, talk with your fists. She was just told you, like, told me to, you know, be the bigger man, brush it off. You know, words can't hurt you. Um, but they obviously did. Mm -hmm. They hurt. They hurt you to a certain extent um, within. Um, you know, because those experiences, you'll always take them throughout your life, the rest of your life. So it does have an impact on you, and you wish you could deal it in a certain way, but you almost respect the way that you have dealt with it. Because if you drop to, if you if you say their levels, you know it's you only you only as bad as them. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy the way I did it, but it's always something that'll always stick with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, mine was similar to you again. I, I was at school, um, but for me, I didn't understand. You know, the person called me the N word. Um, you know, as a young white child, and I just said it back to him. Because I had no idea what the word meant. I'd never heard it in my life. I kind of just thought it was it was another swear word. Um, and I remember the teacher, you know, heard what had happened and put us both in detention. So my mum's waiting for me outside of school. I must have been around seven at the time. Waiting for me in the playground. I hadn't came out. She came into the school. Um, she was like, where's Marvin, obviously? And I said, I was in detention. She's like, what for? They explained. And she goes, get my son out of detention. So my mum came and got me. Um, and that was the first time. And she didn't actually explain to me, you know, what it meant. She just said, it's a really bad word and you shouldn't use it again. And should somebody call you that, then you need to tell a teacher. But as I said, and this is why I always say that kids aren't born racist. No. Because, you know, this child, I don't think would have known what it meant either. Maybe they heard their parent or somebody, you know, within their circle has said this. And they just thought to call me it. Um, and as I said, I just said it back because I had no idea what the word meant. Yeah. It's so true what you say about it sticking with you. Because there's so many incidents when I was younger that my mum talks about me being a child that you know might be about football or you know school or anything else, and I forget them. But every incident of racism that I've faced, you know, from from a child to now 35 years of age, I can remember every single one like it was yesterday. And that's the long-lasting effect that it has on the victims that people don't understand. Um, so it's so true what you say; they they do stick with you, and you know sometimes you do forget about them, but then suddenly you'd just be in bed and you'd be thinking about something, or you watch the television, and it and it brings it all back to you, and it's. Yeah, it's a hard place to be. Has there been many incidents that you've had in football, um, if that was back in England or up in Scotland? Yeah, the uh, two incidents up here. Um, the first one was, was via Twitter. I remember I was playing in, in a derby game. Uh, I came off the pitch, we had won the game, absolutely buzzing. Checked my phone and somebody had, had racially abused me. Um, and I said numerous words and I kind of sat on my phone for a bit and obviously as you can imagine the change room's going crazy, we've just won the game, the boys are saying, all right, let's go out. Um, and I just sat there and it, it was weird because everything kind of went silent around me and I was just focused on my phone and I remember getting up, going to the toilet um, and I was upset. I didn't cry. I was, I was upset. I was upset. I wasn't even angry. I was just so upset that somebody had did this to me and I thought, right, I'm going to reply to the person. And I replied and something quite witty to him and he, and he replied straight back and saying, I was just trying to put you off the game. Now, he had sent this tweet when I was playing a game of football. So I'm not yeah. going to check my phone on the pitch. So I'm only going to check it after. And it was, I wanted to put you off. You know, abusing me about my skin colour and kind of my heritage was, was what he wanted to do to distract me from football. Um, but I remember getting home and I think it, I can't remember if it was that day or the next day. My mum had seen it. So my mum, my mum called me up and as I didn't know it was about that. And I was like, oh, 
mum's calling me, I can't go to pick up. I think it's my watching TV or something. So I picked up and my mum was in tears. And from the start of the phone call, and I had no idea why she was crying. I'm up in Scotland. I've, I've got up straight away thinking, am I gonna have to go back? Has something happened to someone? Something happened to her? And she said to me, you're all right. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Like, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And she said, oh, I've seen, I've seen, <laughs> seen what was said to you. And for that, and, I, and I'll be honest, I, I broke down. You know, me hearing my mum cry is, is the hardest thing in the world that could ever happen to me. Um, and I just thought, you know, somebody's wrote these words, not, not caring about it. He's replied to me already saying, you know, I was trying to put you off your game and you've got my mum in tears. And at that moment in time, and I have to be honest, if I would have been around the person, anything could have happened because I can't see mum, can't hear my mum cry. And, and, sh and she really was broken and I, I calmed her down and said, listen, I'm fine. I'm fine, it's, it's okay, um, don't worry about it. And I think there's an element of, obviously she was upset that her son had been racially abused, but I also think that, you know, she wasn't there to protect me. And at this point, you know, I'm over 30 years of age. I'm, I'm a big man at this point, you know, but I'm her youngest son. I, I am her son, so she wants to protect me. And I was like, no, it's fine. And she said, you need to come home. She said, forget about football, you just need to come home. And that's obviously a motherly instinct, just get my son back around me. And, yeah. and that was hard. That was really, really hard. But um, as I said, you know, it, it was a tweet. And the second time somebody had recorded themselves racially abusing me. Um, I was warming up in a game, another derby game, and the person had recorded themselves racially abusing me. And, and again, she had, she had seen it. And I try and protect her from these things. I didn't even know my mum knew how to work Twitter or Instagram or anything like this. Clearly she does. And she saw the second one. But the second one hurt me more than the first one because, you know, the first one I read kind of in their words, so I read them how I want to read them. The second one, I could hear the anger and the, and the hatred in somebody's voice as they said it about me. And, and that hurt me before speaking to her. And again, she called me and she, she was the same again. She goes, no, I'm coming to Scotland. I'm coming to get you. Just, just forget about football. And, you know, I must admit when I saw the video, you know, I was in tears before my mum because, again, that was more anger than upset. So I was like, why is this happening? You know, why, why is this happening? Why does this person hate me? so much, you know, they could say I'm, I'm poor at football, they hate the team I play for, they hate the way I play football. I can accept all of these things because I've had it throughout my career. Yeah. Um, but to be racially abused was, was difficult. But, you know, I, I made a promise to myself going forward from there that I wouldn't allow these people to hurt me anymore because it was affecting my life, it was affecting my football career. You know, I, I was angry just, just in life for the next probably week or so. And after that one, I don't know what, where I would be now if it wasn't for the club. Obviously, I was at Hibs at the time and the manager was fantastic. The boys rallied around me. Jan Dempster, again, was brilliant. Um, but I had that support network of, of my football club, my teammates, but also, you know, my brothers. You know, they came up to make sure I was OK, my mum. But yeah, that, that was hard. But I said to myself, you know, I'm going to have to emotionally detach myself from these people now because I can't keep going back to that place because it's a dark place, as kind of you, you probably know. Yeah, throughout my career. Um Ever since the social media came on, um, I never received anything down in England, not, not as I know of my knowledge. Um, but coming up here, um, it was the second season, so the season that we soon got promoted, well, the pr promotion season when we were in the Premier League. It was one of those where I received an Instagram direct message. Uh, it was one of the time where, um, I, I, can't for, I can't remember the game, but it was one of those where you just check the messages after the game yeah. and and you're scrolling through it and the first thing that caught my eye was obviously the monkey emoji. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those where you're thinking, oh, has this happened? So I clicked on it and it was just basically just someone getting at me for the colour of my skin and saying how bad of a player I am. And it was one of those moments that straight away because I was sat on the coach heading back um, back to the training ground and I didn't show anybody but it was one of those moments where I was just so infuriated mm -hmm. like I'm now I'm obviously a lot older now from when I was in the school days and, and I can take a lot more now um, and I can do more as, a, as an adult but you know I was infuriated I just wanted to know who that person was why they're saying it and I wanted to get down to the bottom of it, but it was one of those things where I held it back. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I don't think I even told my mum about it, cause, or I don't even know if I told my wife about it, because it was something that I didn't want them to be affected. I wanted to carry, not carry, but you know, carry the burden on me. I don't want 
them to be hurt because I know my mum and my wife look through the things, they see just the normal ones, like, oh, how much of a bad play you are when the people are attacking you. Like, even that affects them. So to add something that's something to do with your race, I've, I just felt at that time, I thought, you know, I can't expose them to this because it's more for me to to deal with another aspect of the of what's just happened. And that's, that's a shame to do because you obviously want to tell your wife and your mum what's happened, you want to get their thoughts, but you know it's going to affect them. Yeah. You know, it's burning inside us. Because yeah. I, never, I never replied back to that person because I wanted to, but mm-hmm. I don't know if I would have been able to control what I've said or, yeah. you know, I've always been brought to be the bigger man, but at that time when, you know, you see the red mist and it's like you're really angry, the best thing for me was just to put my phone to one side and, and just forget about it. And that's when I, I had another one. Um, and it's only been t- twice. And it was something, it was, it's, it was the same on Instagram direct message, similar message. Um, and, you know, I did the same thing. And it's came to a point now where, especially what's been happening in the yeah. past 18 months, how much we've progressed on um, making a stand against it. Um, it's almost how much we've made a stand against it and how vocal we've been. Mm-hmm. It's almost we're attracting more people to say stuff. Yeah. And it's and you see more and more stuff come out now. So it's almost a case where I've got myself now. Do I look on the direct message? Like, do I look on the yeah, messages, yeah. or do I just forget it? Especially after if we lose or we we we're against a team, maybe a derby game. Do you, mm-hmm. do you look? Do you look at your direct messages because you might come across it? Yeah. And it's something where I thought to myself, you know, I, I just don't want it anymore. Just keep myself away from it. You know, I spoke about two instances I had and being emotionally detached after the second one, and that's why I think that I try and be at the forefront of things now, like yourself, um, because not everyone has a support network that we do. You know, I try and take myself back to how I was feeling that day and if I didn't have my my team around me or my mum wasn't there for me or my brothers weren't there for me where I'd be, you know, now even, you know, I might have done something extreme because that's the lowest point in my life, you know, kind of feeling that. And I try and explain it this way that, when it first happened to me, they were kind of wounds and now they're scars. So I look at scars and you're like, oh, I remember what happened there. But when I see players being racially abused now, you know, I, I can't allow for that to happen and me to just sit at home and do nothing. Because, you know, if they don't have any other support network, then I need to be that f- there for them. And I understand when I do this, I get racially abused after. You know, it's constant and it's continuous and it happens all the time. Um, but, but I don't care. Because, you know, I can't have anyone feeling the way that I felt then and have no one around them. Because as I said, and I keep saying to people, one day somebody will take their life over this. And if I sat at home and, you know, allowed that to happen without trying to reach out to the person or put something out there for them to see, I'd never forgive myself. And a lot of people think that's extreme, but it's not. It's the truth. And it will happen. And to some people, like the person who racially abused me the first time on Twitter, these were just words to him. But to me, they weren't. They cut a lot deeper than that. Just words are telling me I'm a bad player. You know, racially abusing me, it's not just words. And that's why, you know, I've been like you, fighting kind of since that day, last 18 months, especially with what's come on social media. And I continue to do so. And you know, people say to me, well, why, why do it? You're going to get racially abused, but why not? You know, if we don't stand up for people who look like us, then we can't expect anyone else to. No, I totally agree with that. And we, You always have to start something and you always have to take mm. the first blows. Yeah. You, know, you know it's coming. And the past 18, 18 months, you know, it's been it's been definitely a challenge. Mm-hmm. So obviously our first game of the season, um, we've had a bit of a dialogue uh, with each other. Um, was there any uncertainty like going into that game? Did you have any worries? Obviously leading up to that game, our first game of the season, knowing what the Euros had delivered. Yeah, massive worries because the only time I'd seen players taking the knee were were down in England when they had like kind of product restart, I think it was called, and a few clubs down there had booed it. And at the Euros, you know, even more fans were booing it. And it was very difficult for me to sit at home and watch that. It was hurtful because I knew other players were doing it. I knew what people were trying to hide behind and trying to muddy the water, even though every single football player had said the reason for it. Um, so obviously leading into that game, I could have been playing anywhere. 
you know, but it was the first game of the season, the first one back with fans, and I was extremely nervous, probably a couple of sleepless nights, if I'm honest, um, even though I knew I wasn't playing. You know, I didn't want to go down, and I'd envisioned you know, going down to take the knee, how I'd react if somebody booed it, or a section had booed it, and I think I'd have been heartbroken. You know, I think it had taken a long, long time for me to recompose myself. You know, I might not have done that during the game. And I kind of put a tweet out after because I think so many times when something negative happens around this, people speak out. The media, you know, jump onto the back of it. It's all over social media. And I said, you know, when I went down to take the knee and I heard people applauding, that's the most important applaud these people will ever make in their lives. I don't care what else they applaud for, whether it's when their children get married, whether it's, you know, you lot winning the league, whatever it might be. This, that was the most important one that I think those people will ever make. And they will never understand just how much that meant to us as players, but also us as black men, to hear that. Yeah, I think it was important to, to get the, the right message out to everybody because you obviously hear um, the, the concerns that people do have and say, oh, it's, it's behind this affiliation mm -hmm. or it's, you're doing it for this reason. But, you know, I wanted to send a statement out and you know, sat down with the gaffer, Ross and David and our main fan, fan groups. Mm -hmm. We're all on a Zoom call and we had a, a good conversation um, of what this message was about and it was key to get the right message out to everybody and, and I couldn't thank everyone um, who turned up and even the positive messages afterwards and the continued support that we've had. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really proud of everyone affiliated to Rangers and and even the places that we have been, it's, you know, people have been doing the right thing. But I'm extremely proud of what happened that first game because you're not wrong. Mm. It was a couple of sleepless nights. You you come into that game thinking, is it going to go the right way? Mm. And I was just so proud from when that first whistle went, everyone everyone applauded. And I couldn't have been such a prouder man and a proud captain of that club to, to actually witness that. Nobody wants to speak about the positives. It doesn't seem that way. You know, but when people do positive things and then I've got replies back saying, that's the norm, that's what should be happening. You're right, that is what should be happening, but it doesn't happen everywhere. And you know, that's why I was so thankful to those people. And obviously your statement that you put out, I think 24 hours before the game, you know, let anyone who thought that it might be about something else or want to still think that way, that changed them. And, and from me to you, I have to thank you for that because you know, that applause doesn't happen without you. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm absolutely delighted that you did do it. And, but you know, I'm even more delighted with the people who, who did clap. It's just one of those where, like you say, you don't want to see other people be affected by it. And, you know, the one that stands out for me is obviously Glenn. Yeah. Because, you know, we're both men and we've never, well, just going off what we've just been talking about, we've never experienced it on the pitch. Yeah. And for him to, to do that, then it wasn't just that. and It, it was obviously the aftermath and seeing how hurt he was like, yeah. after it, but it was the weeks after it when it was the constant like, abuse on the social medias, mm -hmm. then, you know, seeing how much that affected him, um, you know, you, you want to try and be behind him, but it's one of those where these comments do really affect you. Yeah. And yeah. we've obviously got to try and be around the people that who, whoever get this and be supportive of them and obviously try and make a change in, in the future, try and educate people to, to not do this. Yeah. Did you know what happened with Glenn as soon as it happened? Did you? Yeah. Just well, his reaction. Yeah, I could tell by his reaction because uh, I was sat in the stands. Yeah. Um, I had my knee injury, and I could I could tell there was something really wrong because he never reacts like yeah. that. And it was one of those where I got off my seat straight away. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the fast as I could. I could yeah. went down to the touchline, and I knew something was up. And you could you could tell it was just that sense. Even if you look back on it, it's like. You can tell by his reaction straight away, something's yeah. not right because I've never seen him react ever like that. Yeah. So, but the, you know what, the, the full club and the fans and the team, you know, it brought everyone together even more. Yeah. And it really showed great signs of how close we are as a club and even just the outset of people who showed the support, mm -hmm. like yourself and the other clubs who showed the support, it was so good to see that yeah. this can be done and that we're here for things to change. What was the, the dressing room like, obviously, when UEFA had made a decision on kind of the verdict of, of it and obviously finding the player guilty? Um, it's obviously, you're obviously happy that he got found guilty. Um, I know 
they're obviously trying to argue their case mm-hmm. but I clearly know my player yeah. and I know he's not a liar and you've seen his reaction straight after what happened um, it's obviously good that they did implement a ban but you, you do want to see more um, you see things um, throughout the game stadium bans and it's like it's one thing that we we played um, Spa the the other week and obviously they had a ban from the, the Monaco game so they were only allowed children in and it's something that I didn't really like pick on straight away yeah it was only until afterwards you know, I think the gaffer mentioned it as well mm. that there was 10,000 kids in the stadium mm-hmm. and when Glenn got the ball they were booing him yeah and I got asked that question straight after the game and I said oh I, I didn't re- recognize it I didn't I didn't I didn't hear it which I didn't it's only until I watched the game back again I'm thinking that actually happened yeah and these are these are children yeah and and it's such a sad thing to see but you want but if you put that to one side obviously allowing kids into the stadium but anyone who makes these remarks if it's fans there's got to be bigger penalties yeah and your way for have to stamp on this a lot more because they have the captain's arm man they have the the sponsor on the sleeves show yeah. racism like no no to racism respect but there's clearly not that in in and around the world yeah that's fully supporting that and anyone who's not supporting that has to be punished you know severely so obviously we talk about uh uefa and i know you're a big part of the sfa now mm-hmm. um what are your plans um to obviously change it so we're, we're trying obviously like you say to, to change the game in scotland um, recently we've had a rise in cases where people have been kind of racially abused on the football pitch. Um, this started in March, it was just around the Glen Kamara incident actually. You know, I'd spoken to them maybe two weeks prior to that and just so happened that the role was announced I think just after the Kamara incident. Um, for me, I, I want a lot of changes as you can imagine. Um, you know, I'm probably boring them with some of the things I'm saying but they are also trying. Um, I think that when somebody's found guilty of racially abusing a player, especially player to player, it should be a year's ban. You know, there's no way that you should be back in five games after racially abusing you on a football pitch. But if you're found guilty of, say, betting, for example, or you get a hamstring injury, you're out for even longer. You know, the same way that it affects the victim when people say these sorts of things, it has to affect the person who said it. The second was um, a text service. You know, again, we spoke about it in, back in March, and I think that the Scottish FA are trying to bring it in now, where if your mum, for example, comes to watch you, she might hear somebody behind you racially abuse you. She doesn't want to turn around and say, that's my son and she turns around and see four blokes, for example, because she wants to be safe. Yeah. But she should be able to send a message to say, I'm sitting here. And while it's happening, by the way, I'm sitting in this seat. This is the minute it happened in. And all clubs within you know, the Premier League, especially, have CCTV where they can rewind, zoom in, and see exactly what people are saying. Yeah. People need to be held accountable for what they're doing. And I think for far too long, it's not happened. Um, the third thing that I want to introduce is to make sure clubs are doing these investigations properly. So the Scottish FA have a tick list of when somebody is racially abused or brings up a grievance. Um, any any form of discriminative like kind of message or something said to them, these are the things that you must do within this time period, and the Scottish FA will hold you accountable if the clubs don't do it, because I think sometimes clubs will put out a tweet saying we're holding an investigation, and far too many times you see ten days later the investigation's concluded. Unfortunately, we won't be able to find anybody. But what are they actually doing with these investigations? I'm not saying that they're not doing these things properly, yeah. but we need to make sure that they are, um, because. Me personally, you know, I know of one experience where it wasn't done properly and it breaks my heart to know that. Um, so that's something that I hope the Scottish FA will also bring in. You know, as a parent of, of young children, you know, how do you think that the world's going to be, you know, when they get to kind of our age, what do you want to see change? Because obviously you don't want them to go through the same experiences that we've gone through. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scared in a way mm-hmm. because back when we were kids, we want phones, laptops, iPads, you know, you'd be playing on the street, um, kicking the roll, kicking the ball around with your friends. Um, but now these days, you know, my my daughter and son have got an iPad. They're watching YouTube, um, kids YouTube, and you know, lots on the internet these days. The players are out, out as much as they can, but a lot of everything is technology now. And you know, I'm I'm scared for them. It's like I've told them not to go on YouTube because I know they click on something wrong, it it, it might affect them. Yeah. Um, so 
I'm hoping a lot changes around stuff like that, but I'm I'm scared from it in a way because I know the world's moving fast and technology is moving really quick and it's so easy to click on the wrong thing these days online. Um, so I'm just trying to be as protective as I can um, when it comes to that front. In school, it's one of those, if you're you're a parent, you're always waiting. Um, if you ever will have that chat, that me and my mum had that chat. Um, it's one of those, you know, if the kid's being brought up the right way, nothing will be said, but if the kid's not being brought up in the right way, um, like we said before, you know, I'm almost waiting for that day um, when I have, I'll have to have a chat with my kids. Hopefully it doesn't come, but yeah. it's something that I've always prepared myself for, which is sad, um, sad knowing. Um, but it's it's just the world we live in at the minute. Yeah, no, that's so true. Like society is that way, and it's so sad. And you know, I've been saying recently that I've enjoyed you know a football career that I came into the age of twenty. I'm obviously now thirty five. I'm an assistant manager. Um, I'm enjoying that. But for me, you know, the biggest impact I think that I can make, you know, especially in Scotland, would be trying to change things in terms of society. You know, obviously, I enjoyed winning the Scottish Cup. But you don't want to talk about too much. But I, enjoy, I enjoyed that, you know. You got promoted from the Championship after you lot have gone up the year before, so you got one back over me then. But, <laughs> I'm happy you know, for you. Yeah. <laughs> society is so much more important for me because, you know, you fearing that what your kids might go through and other parents will be out there watching this as well. You know, I'd much rather be changing that and hand back anything I've achieved in football because I don't want any kid to have to go through the things that we've been through because I just don't believe it's right. And no. I believe the only people that can change it, the people that are watching this, the people that are out there on social media, you know, if the governments and the powers that be don't want to change it, then us as people, you know, we can change it.